Hey, is evolution a hoax? You know, when I became an atheist, I began to watch the debates between atheists and Christians, and evolution kept coming up as a reason to why God didn't exist, was because we have evolution. And that really puzzled me, because before I was an atheist, I was an agnostic. And the reason I became an atheist was really because of the problem of evil. It wasn't because of evolution. When it came to evolution, I thought that, well, if God doesn't exist, well, maybe evolution is how things came about. But if he does exist, then he could have just as easily created a process to create organisms. Well, I think we can see that just if we make the analogy of a factory that creates cars. You can have a process of a factory and that can create a car, but just because you have a process does not eliminate the fact that you have someone that designed the factory. I didn't really get why atheists were using evolution as one of the main points to say that God didn't exist. So when these statements kept getting raised in these debates, that really put it upon me to go and check out evolution. And I'm going to link up an article that's going to be linked in the bottom of this video that comes from PBS and it talks about the evolution of the whale. And in that article, there's a lot of language that is used that is very telling. To start off, the story of the evolution of the whale goes something like this. It started off as a smaller land-dwelling creature and then evolved into the sea-going whale that we now see today. So that's something in itself. The whale, if you didn't know this before, started as a land-dwelling animal. The beginnings of a whale supposedly started with a creature called Pachycetus. And let's take a look at a picture of Pachycetus. Now let's take a look at the modern-day whale. Let's take a look at that one more time. Does anyone recognize a problem there? Do you see the differences just in appearance of those two creatures? Well, the problems get a little more difficult as we go on. You know, in talking about the whale in the article that I'm going to reference, um, I'm going to start off with a little quote from that article. And it says, Some details remain fuzzy and under investigation, but we know for certain that this back-to-the-water evolution did occur thanks to a profusion of intermediate fossils that have been uncovered over the past two decades. Hmm, profusion. Well, when it comes to this profusion of intermediate fossils, this large amount of fossils that we have, you know, this very big transition sequence, here is the transition sequence of the whale. There's a problem with that, and the questions that lead to that big problem are actually very simple. To start, what led to the creation of the land-dwelling creature? You know, this is a common thing within evolution, that you start at a fully formed creature and then evolve to another creature. But that's really not how things are supposed to have started. Everything's really supposed to have come out of the slime and out of the ooze not start as fully formed creatures. Another question is, why did this land-dwelling creature change into a whale? Do we know? Or are we just taking a guess? Another good question to ask is, how did any transitional form of the species survive by procreation in this whole process? It seems that that would become very difficult, especially in the transitional stages. Is anyone asking that question? Another good question to ask is, how do we take into account the complete reformation of the outside structure of a creature and also factoring in that the complete inner workings of the creature have to be completely overhauled and changed. You know evolution, especially if you go to like a natural history museum, a lot of times you're going to see bones. You know, bones going from this to this to this to this. The problem is, is that the bones are not really the problem. Do you know how complicated the digestive system is, the circulatory system, the nervous system, 
How are these things changing? If you start out with a land-dwelling creature, these things have to be completely restrung. You have to get the brain from one point to another point. The nose has to go to the top of the head from the front. How does that happen? The skin has to become waterproof. The whale then has to have a diving apparatus too. How does that happen? All of these inner changes have to happen. You know, there are many, many, many systems that are at work within an organism. And they all have to be changed and rerouted for really no reason. How is that possible? When you just see bones, it makes it seem so much simpler than it is when bones are seemingly just moving. And again, when we think about these changes that would have to take place, you would think that we would see more than four transitional creatures. We should more likely see thousands upon thousands upon thousands of transitional creatures. Another question that no one asks is that when we have a change, an evolutionary change happen, doesn't that affect the entire ecosystem, the entire food chain? You know, if one creature is evolving, the entire ecosystem, the entire food chain needs to be rapidly evolving to handle this. Everything has to be evolving if one thing is going to switch out of one capacity and take another. So how is the food chain able to be keeping intact and not collapsing on itself when one creature just decides to evolve? These questions are never raised. Why aren't they raised? When you're so sure, so for certain that something did happen, and yet so many unanswered questions remain, that's a problem because you should not be so sure. And it should not be a problem if you're not so sure. You know, if we go down to the bottom of this article, it says none of these animals is necessarily a direct ancestor of the whales we know today. They may be side branches of the family tree. Well, that doesn't sound like certainty to me. So we are certain that this did occur, but yet things may be something or other. I think the biggest uh, kicker for this article happens at the end, um, and it says, as evolutionary biologist Neil Shubin points out, quotations, in one sense, evolution didn't invent anything new with whales. It was just tinkering with land mammals. It's using the old to make the new. No. No, 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 no. No. First of all, evolution does not invent anything, and it also doesn't tinker. Evolution has no mind. It does not have any capacity to invent or tinker with anything. And this is the rhetoric that is used in articles like this, and this is the problem. We are giving creative ability to randomness and time. It has no creative ability at all. So to force creative ability upon it, is very telling. You know, in addition to this PBS link, I'm going to link in um, a book that I've written, and one link is to a Kindle, Amazon version of the book, and the other is to a free PDF version. There are two essays that deal with what I'm talking about right now. One is actually about the whale, and it's called Heart of the Imagination. And another one is called Nails in the Coffin of God, which is the title essay. And if we put the whale to the side for a moment, if we just take one human being, and just the evolution of the human being, but just take the end process for one human being, we can also pose another scenario. Let's get some background here. The Big Bang is supposed to have come out of, you know, nothingness. So the universe exploded out of nothingness. So that's the start. So in the scientific view, the start is that the universe came out of nothingness. So out of nothing, came everything. So out of no thing, no thing, nothing, came things. And then out of nothing sprang up this process, this evolutionary process. And so the consensus is this uh, little passage that I'm going to read out of Nails in the Coffin of God. The consensus is that an unguided process using random mutation and natural selection has somehow created a supercomputer that is made up of cellular supercomputers that possesses a seemingly unlimited memory capacity and is in fact self-healing, self-replicating, self-sufficient, and to top it off, able to design its own self-updating software. 
Does this make any sense? This process, using randomness and time, has created a supercomputer which is composed of cellular supercomputers because each cell in your body is a supercomputer that has a seemingly unlimited memory capacity. I mean, we don't have any delete button on our memory. How does that happen? That we cannot fill up our memory bank. And it's also self-healing. You know, if you cut yourself, that'll probably heal within like three days. Imagine you cut your laptop screen or something like that and then you go back three days later and that's gone. Wouldn't that be amazing? Well, that's what organisms do, human being we're talking about here. That's what a human being can do. It's also self-replicating, you know, babies. Imagine your disk drive popped out and a computer just sprung out of another computer. Wouldn't that be amazing? That's what humans do. And another thing is that it designed its own self-updating software. You know, DNA code is a software. It's a set of instructions that allows an organism to function. Software is a set of instructions that allows a computer to function. They're the same definition. So how does hardware, the body, program its own software, the DNA code? It's impossible. You know, if we take any computer program, what do we find from that? Well, to create a computer program, usually the creator of the program exists outside of the reality of the program. So if you have a computer game and you have characters with code in them, usually the creator is on the outside programming the game. So if we have DNA code, it stands to reason that there is a creator. You know, the common analogy that evolutionary biologists give is that if you take monkeys and give them typewriters and put them in a room, give them an infinite amount of time, that in that time they will, through typing, produce the works of William Shakespeare. Now that's an interesting analogy, but the problem is, is that it's not even close to evolution. First of all, you have fully formed monkeys, you have equipment, typewriters, and you have a goal, which is the works of William Shakespeare. Evolution is not anything like that. Evolution will start out with particles. I mean, it doesn't start out with fully formed organisms. A closer analogy, and this is even simplifying it even more because it should be a lot more complicated than what I'm about to say, but a better analogy to evolution would be if we take a bunch of metal parts and then just put them in a room and let them float for a finite amount of time, because also evolution does not have an infinite amount of time. It has a finite amount of time. So if we have these parts floating around for a finite amount of time, that somehow a computer gets created, and then that computer writes its own software. You know, I want you to go to any computer engineer and ask them if it's possible that the hardware write its own software. I bet you that they laugh at you. The fact of the matter is that this is really not about science. If it was about science, there wouldn't be this rage when you bring things up like this. Because I guarantee that a lot of hate will come from just watching this video. And why should it really, if this is just a scientific theory we're just debating and questioning? There shouldn't be any hate attached to it. It's just, maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong. If it's right, it's right, it's wrong, it's wrong. There really shouldn't be any hate. But when you watch videos like this, you see hate in the comment boxes. It has to be true. Evolution has to be true. How dare you ask any questions about evolution? And why is that? Well, when I go back to those debates that I would watch, I remember one specifically with Richard Dawkins, who you might know. He's a famous uh, atheist evolutionary biologist. You know, an issue was raised at a certain point in the debate that uh, Sir Isaac Newton, who was probably the most famous scientist of all time, actually wrote more about theology than he ever did about science. Which is a fact, and you can go look that up. And to go back against this point, Richard Dawkins said, well, yeah, of course, you know, Sir Isaac Newton wrote more about theology because, you know, he believed in God, but everyone did back then. And that was interesting for me, and the reason being is that at the same time in the atheist framework that I was in, I began to start reading the Bible, and I came across a passage at that same time that spoke to me very, very clearly. I'm going to read that for you right now. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, into birds, into four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them unto uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to desire their own bodies between themselves. Changed the truth of God into a lie, 
and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. When I read that, I realized two things. That either Richard Dawkins was not up to date on his facts, or that this passage is talking more about the current time in history than it was back then. To say that evolution is inventing or tinkering, when that's not possible without a mind. Nothingness cannot invent or tinker. And to give it those kind of characteristics or abilities is really telling. That you would rather worship and serve this creature more than ask the questions that might get you to the creator. And the reason why there is such rage when people discuss evolution is because it's not about evolution. It's about erasing the creator. You know, I really have to thank evolution because it was probably one of the biggest things that pushed me back towards believing in God. So if you find yourself in a place right now where I was back then as a atheist and you're asking these questions in your mind, I would suggest just taking a look at the link below uh, for the article and then also uh, downloading a free copy of the book because we need to be heading towards the truth, not away from it. Because the way the truth does mean life, we need to listen to the truth.